So, without further ado, let me, uh, uh, let me call to the podium Nessa Cronin. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, Connor. Uh, it's very, we were talking about discomfort and uncomfortableness this morning. I think it was Nicola was saying, well, after an introduction like that, and also that John gave me his watch, which I take as a sign that I do have to be on time. Um, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here and to be part of the event uh, today. Um, in particular, I just want to say, Miela Buica So um kind of kind of gondu like a special special the home fresh and free Tim Agus Marade. Um in many ways I'm going to quote Robert Lloyd Prager um later on in the in the in my talk um how he saw that the field clubs that were generated and and kind of really took off in the late 19th century in Ireland were for many people a first or a second university. Um, and for me, I suppose here, this is my university, but I would say very much that a, a special place out in Roundstone was a second university for me over the last few years. So, we'll break as we should. Um, so I'm here uh, today just to uh, introduce um, a, a different way of thinking about uh, island space and I'm taking as an example of that, uh, I'm moving a little bit further south um, to uh, Valencia Island, but I will start with the rumination on the west where we are uh, at the moment. Um, uh, in Connemara, Last Pool of Darkness, Tim Robinson opens a chapter on Killary Harbour with a story about exotic mermen that were sighted in the area. In recalling an incident as, as noted by the Connacht Tribune in 1936, Robinson notes how two local fishermen reported that they saw a floating object in the cove Fui Naman, the cove of the women, which they initially took to be some sort of windfall. As they rowed up close to it, Tim writes, they got a fright when it turned around and revealed the features of a man. It growled at them in annoyance and dived beneath, beneath their curragh and pursued them for over 200 yards before disappearing into the depths. There is, surely, Tim Robinson uh, continues, quote, nothing in these merman stories except perhaps exotic sea mammals storm blown in from Iceland or further afield, or more likely, the, usually, the usual factors of drink, prank, exaggeration and lies. But North Connemara also has its own mermaid, the elemental artist, as Tim refers to her, Dorothy Cross, who lives in Mullet Glass, about five miles west of Little Killery. Later in the chapter, Tim Robinson notes how Cross found the body of, of uh, Cuvier's whale and writes that, quote, I had already seen photographs of it, of it being carried home for her, draped across the bucket of a digger and dangling down to the ground on either side. Its remains have not yet mutated into anything rich and rare, end quote. This mutation would happen in time as the whale was left to decompose in Cross's garden, the skeleton of which would later be used for her in an exhibition entitled Galapagos, which took place in the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh um, later, uh, actually last winter and into the spring uh, this year. While Connemara had its mermaid in the artist of Dorothy Cross, uh, this paper explores the life and work of another woman whose life was shaped by maritime ecologies on the western seaboard, Maud Lap of Valencia Island. Today, Delap is primarily remembered for her contribution to British and Irish natural history through her work elaborating the complex life cycle of the jellyfish and for her significant contribution, along with her sister Constance, to a maritime survey of Valencia Island that was later published by the Royal Irish Academy in 1900. Her work is embedded within the heavily gendered, situated knowledge of late Victorian natural history and my reading of De Lapp and her life on Valencia today explores the wider networks and pathways of knowledge between British and Irish scientific culture and scholarly life in the period. Such networks were more often than not highly gendered, and one can easily trace what geographer Julian Rose has called paternal lines of descent in women scientists and their families in the period. Other than brief acknowledgements of De Lapp's contribution to this area by Robert Lloyd Prager, uh, Tim Collins and Mary Mulvihill, and one short biographical um, essay by Anne Byrne and a more recent uh, contribution uh, by Breda Joy in a book called Hidden Kerry, which I always find interesting. My mother's from Kerry, so I feel I can say this. Kerry people are never shy of hiding things, so I think it's a very interesting title for a book. Uh, there has been no sustained critical attention directed at Elap's work and her contribution to our understanding of the history of natural science and contemporary coastal heritages in Ireland and Britain today. Indeed, revisiting Cross, 
the most recent investigation of her legacy has been made and interpreted by Dorothy and Tom Cross, um, who is her brother, in a video installation called Come Into the Garden Maud, created in 2001, and a later collaborative work um, on the subject uh, with Tom, who's a zoologist in UCC, entitled Medusae, which was funded as a jointly funded art and science project back in uh, 2000 and 2003. While this aspect of Delap's legacy lies, lies outside the scope of this paper today, it does, however, point to other ways and other legacies that we can see um, how heritages uh, are uh, articulated and gain a presence in the landscape beyond uh, the confines of the university. The study of Delap and our island home is one chapter in the history of Atlantic coastal heritages then. It therefore demands a careful assessment of the particular intellectual milieu in which Delap worked for most of her adult life, as well as considering the broader cultural and social worlds of the spaces of what I call domestic science um, culture in late Victorian Ireland. While much critical work on women naturalists and travellers in the period often focuses on women from elite backgrounds, I would argue that a critical rereading of late Victorian scientific culture can be elucidated through the lens of geography and gender in showing alternative pathways to and scientific knowledge of in Ireland in this period. Are we thinking then of the margins of the margin, an island off the west coast of Ireland, helps us explain how an, un, un, an uneducated rector's daughter on an island off the coast of Kerry would become an international expert in maritime ecologies, culminating in the offer of, of a professional position in Plymouth, membership of the Linnaean Society, and indeed in having the highest accolade a natural scientist can attain in having a new species named in her honour. Delap and her island home then challenged the received narratives of the Victorian natural hist uh, historian in being female, untravelled, and someone who recognised local place as a valuable and validated space of study. And thus she made her home and her garden her working laboratory. While many accounts of women naturalists and travellers in the period foreground mobility and movement as a key feature of fieldwork cultures, in the case of Delap, however, what is striking is not her mobility, but her location. Delap's island life and work therefore offers an alternative view onto the world on the Atlantic edge, a world that was also, as we shall later see, at the heart of fieldwork cultures and imperial sciences of late Victorian Britain. Uh, Maud Jane Delap was born in 1866 in Temple Crone Rectory in County Donegal, the seventh of ten children uh, born to Reverend Alexander Delap and Anna Jane Goslett. In 1874, the family moved to Knightstown, Valencia Island, where her father was appointed rector of Valencia and Carrasavine. Delap's father was a member of the Belfast Field Club, an avid amateur naturalist that frequently collected and sent specimens, not the people, I hope, uh, to the Dublin Natural History Museum and was a contributor to the, natural, uh, the Irish Naturalist Journal over the course of his life. Between 1895 and 96, Maud was actively involved, along with her sister Constance, with the Valencia Island Survey, a survey of flora and fauna of Valencia by nine scientists led by Edward T. Brown of the University of London. The Mrs. de Lapp, as they became collectively known, were very much liked and respected locally, with their great-grandnephew Peter de Lapp recollecting in his memoir that, quote, wherever we went, she, Maud, was instantly recognised and greeted with delight. He also notes that Maud was, quote, an old-school Victorian all-round naturalist, and we learned very much from her. In an interview conducted with Joanna Lee, a grandniece of Maud de Lapp, Lee also recalls that it was noted in the family that Mary told you what should be done, Maud got it done, and Connie was the gentle one who comforted you. So she said it was an alternative form of the Holy Trinity, the three sisters minding everybody. As with many self-taught female natural scientists in the Victorian period, Maud had no formal education and was greatly influenced by her father's interest in marine biology, zoology, and botany in particular. Following his footsteps in 1894, she started a correspondence with Dr. Scharf of the Natural History Museum in Dublin, as it would then become, in sending observations, field notes, letters, and preserved specimens to Dublin, a practice that she would retain with the museum until 1949. In 1906, as I noted earlier, she was offered a post in the Marine Biological Station in Plymouth, but turned it down as according to her nephew, Peter de Lapp, her father said that, quote, no daughter of mine will leave this house unmarried, end quote. And during the interwar years, she was the official recorder of whale strandings in Southwest Ireland for a study conducted by Dr. Fraser of the British Museum. And it's this kind of idea of the whale that I'll return to uh, later on. <laughs> 
1928, her scientific work was acknowledged when Carl Grin and Stevenson named a sea enemy after her at Worcester de Lapier. And in, in 1936, her contribution to marine biology was acknowledged when she was made an associate of the Linnaean Society in London. There are over 40 references to her and Constance's contribution to the Venture Survey, and there were 81 noted entries of specimen donations in the National Museum of Ireland under the name of de Lapp, most of which are attributed directly to Maud. She published over 15 articles between 1901 and 24 in journals as diverse as the Irish Naturalist, the Kerry Archaeological Magazine, Fisheries Ireland, and was also a member of Common Bailey the Snaheran, the Irish Folklore Society, and contributed field notes, information, and freely gave advice to scholars in the areas of botany, zoology, marine biology, and folklore throughout her lifetime. Valencia Island is in many ways an anomaly and an exception to all the perceived rules concerning West of Ireland life uh, and island life in this period. On the one hand, due to its physical location as an island off the west coast of Kerry, just measuring seven miles by two in, in size, one could be forgiven for, ease, for thinking that its remote location as holding a distinct disadvantage for the islanders. But it is precisely its location that, that led the island to, to its prosperity and to give that lent its, its, its ex exceptional status in mid-19th century Ireland. Valencia then may have in many ways have been cut off from the mainland, but it was also connected to the rest of the world in many different ways. While it was physically disconnected from the mainland during de Lapp's lifetime, with the bridge to the mainland opening in 1971, it was scientifically, economically, and intellectually connected to the cultural and scientific worlds of metropolitan Dublin, London, and New York, due to the location of a telegraph station, weather station, and an observatory on the island. Um, so this is kind of courtesy of almost a conversation I've had with Tyg Foley here, who claimed actually that Clifton should be the centre of the universe rather than Valencia. Uh, Valencia is here literally the centre of the universe. Uh, Clifton could also call on that, I suppose, because of the location of Marconi. So uh, thank you, uh, Professor Foley, for that. In many ways then, Valencia, its land and waterscapes, was an open laboratory with science as its bridge to the world. As illustrated by the title of a book by Nelly O'Cleary, Valencia was indeed a different Irish island and was remarkably different on how life in other Western islands were being culturally mapped, translated and represented at the time. And we've seen this uh, with Justin's paper this morning as well. If Yeats could have reasonably said to sing to go to Aaron to express a life that has never found expression, except as Tim Robinson has noted, it had found plenty of expression, but just in a different language. Uh, the same could not be sent for Valencia in terms of it being an unknown entity to an Anglophone world in this period. In the decade before the famine, the island had a population of approximately 3,000 people, and today just over 600 claim it as its primary uh, residence. In the 19th century, it had three major industries, uh, fishing with over half a million mackerel being landed daily in 1912, uh, slate quarrying, uh, with Geocon uh, quarries being opened in 1816, which employed over 500 people at the height um, of its industry. And finally, communications, as it was the European terminus for the first transatlantic cable from Newfoundland to Valencia, uh, which started in 1856, with a telegraph station opening in 1865. There was also a Coast Guard station, in, in addition to the Valencia Meteorological Station, at the observatory, which is now housed in Carcevine, but is still called today in the weather forecast, the Valencia Observatory. The first post office was established on the island in 1820, and the wireless station established by Marconi in the 1890s, uh, and which was then taken over by the, the British post office was in 1909. Due to the geopolitical history of the island then and, the, very, and the, the development of various industries around its natural resources, it had an unusually diverse religious community of Catholics, Quakers, United Methodists, congrega Congregationalists and members of the established Church of Ireland for an island population. There was also a strong bilingual context where the western part of the island from Brayhead to Chapeltown was predominantly Irish speaking with Knightstown and its hinterland being the English speaking areas. As O'Cleary observes, quote, even the air was different once the hill above Knightstown was crossed. The smell of the coal fires burning in the cable station and the lightkeeper's houses in the village was replaced by the turf smoke from the rural houses, end quote. The island also had two golf courses, football fields, tennis courts, an active amateur theatrical society, a royal hotel, and a branch of the Cooperative Agricultural Bank. Valencia then can be seen as an exemplary maritime site of national and imperial fieldwork that was then later to be reproduced, displayed, redisplayed, and published in various international urban contexts. 
What we find then is what uh, cultural geographers have discussed as competing sets of cultural geographies that are produced by different fieldwork practices and cultural epistemes. As geographer Dermot Finnegan stresses in his work on the connections between fieldwork and the natural sciences in the Scottish Highlands in the same period, he writes, quote, a distinction between the locational geographies of mountain fieldwork and the geographies produced by the same fieldwork remains a useful heuristic, end quote. This distinction is indeed a critical one in terms of how we view Valencia as both enabling and producing culturally encoded fieldwork practices within the context of its own regional, national and imperial geographies. Um, and these different photographs this morning from Justin and these, you can see just the, the figure on the top of the Fahar Cliffs here. So again, th these photographs at the time are very much about, you know, the people are doing things and we'll have a look at some other uh, photos uh, later on as well. In many ways, and often more problematically, however, the role of gender in science and natural history internationally has also been overlooked, with recent work in Anglophone cultural geography and European intellectual history seeking to remedy this neglect. In, in her introduction to Stars, Shells and Bluebells, Women Scientists and Pioneers, then President Mary Robinson writes that, quote, Ireland has begun to retrieve and acknowledge its remarkable historical tradition of achievement in science. However, many aspects of this tradition remain unchronicled, and none more so than the contribution of Irish women." End quote. In Science, Colonialism in Ireland, Nicholas White traces the history of Irish science from 1890 to 1930, but notes in his introduction that other aspects of Irish science could have been explored, time and space permitting, one of these areas being women in science. Historian Endelini argues that while historians have recently begun to recover the legacies of scientific culture in Ireland, their focus, however, has been largely on an institutional bias, with studies focusing on museums, observatories, and elite scientific cultures and societies. In many ways, then, the re-examination of the history of Irish natural history is about the interconnections between the history of science and the history of culture, society, and uh, politics. Um, and one, I suppose, uh, image that I'm particularly fond of from the archive, one of the archives here in Galway is uh, a photograph here of Mountaineers and Ben Leshery um, taken in 1895 as part of the Irish Field Club Union Conference. Um, again, I think Justin uh, referenced this earlier today, but you'll see in a moment there is somebody lurking, somebody else lurking on the mountain and it's possibly the first depiction of a woman mountaineer. So there she is there. Um, so is Mar Mary Boren actually in the library uh, pointed that out. So you have one gentleman on one side and then uh, the lady nestled into the landscape on the other. Uh, Cheryl McEwen argues that women's struggle to be recognized as scientists has had a long history and notes that while popular science for middle-class women increased during the late 18th century, so did the gap between professionalism and amateurism high in popular science and women often then became the unpaid and visible uh, assistants to scientific husbands or fathers at the home because they were largely barred from the universities. The public works of, of, work, of, the public works of men then were therefore, quote, often based on a certain extent on the invisible private amateur work of women taking place in the domestic realm, end quote. As cultural historian Dorinda Outram has noted, little critical attention should be paid to the use of the domestic space in science, particularly in the context of the gendering of the natural sciences and the role that amateur women, scientists, field workers and writers played in the constructions of a European scientific culture. While women were denied access often to the laboratories of learned and scholarly institutions, many middle class women were actively encouraged to engage in scientific pursuits in what was regarded as the private domestic laboratory. This was, as McEwen notes, primarily aimed at leisured women, as it was thought that the menial and mechanical nature of the work was a suitable hobby for such women, while also allowing for what she terms the category of the more intelligent women to be relieved of depression and boredom. The home laboratory was therefore seen as an extension of the, of the, the domestic sphere. Field work which entailed the investigation of the search for material and data gleaned and made in the field also involved the exercise then of a particular kind of masculinity. In this formulation then, the field as an, as an object is feminized, something to be observed, conquered, mapped and managed, with the work being a masculine occupation and operation. Um, and in a kind of a, an extended version of this paper, which forms a chapter of a book on, on coastal heritages, I go into more detail about the physicality of, of what Maud Laps does and how her work of field work takes place at sea, but it also complicates the idea of women's, of women's strength and stamina in the period as well. 
In the sense then, Victorian fieldwork follows on from what Felix Driver has noted as being a masculine geography militant in the 19th, in 19th century Imperial Britain, except here the scale has been reduced to local place as opposed to the exotic spaces of empire. It is also, however, important to note that fieldwork conversely offered women a space and an opportunity to engage with science at a time when advanced formal education was often closed. As Mona Domosha argues, quote, denied access to the academic training that would confer on them the appropriate status as scientists, women like Mary Kingsley, Mary Grant, Isabella Bird, and Marianne North found that fieldwork in the sense of exploration was as open to them as anyone with adequate resources, end quote. This is what's important here is the idea of adequate resources in many ways because it's very much also a, a class-based uh, activity in many ways too. Uh, the, uh, and so for someone like Robert Lloyd Prager, he may have regarded the, Belf the Belfast Naturalist Field Club as, quote, a second university in which I formed friendships which, despite the disparity of age, remained warm and intimate, and through which I acquired knowledge of field lore, botanical, zoological and geological, which, which stood to me throughout my life, end quote. For many, for many women in Britain and Ireland at this time, field clubs often served as first universities in addition to be, being regarded as what Timothy Collins refers to as field and flirtation societies, uh, due to the social nature of their gatherings and outings as well. Um, and this is just one of the photographs from the Balfour album uh, here in Galway, uh, which shows the landing on Arran uh, for the famous field club trip of the 1890s. Um, the presence of shell, bone and coral specimens in the Dilap archive in the Valencia Heritage Centre illustrates the collecting and preserving practices that Dilap experimented with, in addition to demonstrating the range of interests that she had in Valencia's natural environment. Um, and in many ways, this reflects as well what you'll see when you go to visit the exhibition space afterwards, um, similar practices that uh, Tim Robinson engaged with as well in, in, in gathering the material aspects of culture uh, in, in the West. She also encouraged other islanders to collect specimens and wrote to the Dublin Natural History Museum on several occasions uh, to say that they should pay for such specimens when and where possible to encourage other field work to be conducted by local people from the region. While there are many stories surrounding Dilap's energy and fastidiousness, one instant in particular, Aunt Maud's Whale, as retold by John Barley, gives an indication of the practicalities of field work at the time. It also illustrates how her garden functioned as an extension of the third space where her, her private laboratory and public field work melded into one. And here the overlap and the resonance with Dorothy Cross and her Cuvier's whale uh, comes to bear. So before the Second World War, the renowned whale expert, Dr. Fraser of the British Museum, published several, several reports concerning whale strandings across Britain and Ireland. Fraser uh, recruited a body of watchers to send reports to him at intervals, and Maud was provided with books and notes on how to identify the different species, and so became the official reporter for her corner of Ireland. Barley notes that sometime in the 1920s, Maud became aware that, quote, a whale had been thrown up on the rocks beyond the lighthouse. And so she set out, accompanied by her handyman Mike, and an increasing crowd of hangers-on and small boys. And apparently this is quite the norm, that they'd see Maud kind of traipsing around the island and collecting random specimens, and they'd be, the onlookers would follow her with her entourage. The whale was reported as being about 16 feet long and probably weighed a ton or two, and had already started to decompose. Maud decided, and again she was referring to the notes that she had received from the British Museum, she decided that it was a specimen of True's beaked whale, a rare species discovered from an incomplete specimen in 1913 in North Carolina, which had been examined and described by a Dr. True of New York Museum. Maud went home and sent a letter asking for instructions from the museum in Dublin, as writing was her preferred mode of communication, as Barley informs us that, quote, the telephone had been invented by then, but Aunt Maud never used one. Within a few days, she received a letter with the instruction to cut off the head and flippers and send them on to the museum as soon as possible, and to bury the skeleton in a safe place so that, quote, the skeleton could be recovered in due course. Armed with an assortment of butchering implements, the whale was disarticulated and cut into manageable lumps, and then carried by cart to her garden, where she proceeded to take the flesh off the bones. Apologies, you're just after having your lunch now. So. Uh, in this, it appears that Maud was assisted by Mike, or Michael, uh, a local man who also helped to maintain the house and gardens for the sisters. After photographing the head, she then wrapped it and the flippers in newspaper and sacking and put them into a wooden case and dispatched them for the, to the museum. Usually this was done by train. The remainder of the whale was then, importantly, buried in the asparagus patch in the garden. <laughs> 
A couple of years later, a letter came from the museum asking for the remaining bones to be sent up to Dublin. Quote, again from the Delap memoir, up came the asparagus and a large number of still very smelly bones were recovered and sent on to the museum, end quote. Then yet another letter arrived announcing that two bones were missing, the vestigial pelvic bones. So, quote again, up came the long-suffering asparagus and Mike and Mox, Ma Maud spent several days sieving through the earth searching for the lost bones when a telegram arrived from the museum. Stop. <laughs> New York Museum informs us that True's beaked whale does not possess vestigial bones. <laughs> the Zoological Register of the National Museum of Ireland states that the whale was actually stranded in April 1935 and not in the 1920s, as recorded in uh, the memoir. With the head and the flippers being forwarded in May of that year, and the skeleton was buried by Mr. Lapp and sent to the museum in 1936. This instance shows that Maud undertook the physical work of identifying and obtaining specimens, was in regular contact with both the Dublin and London museums by post and telegrams, not by phone, and was familiar with the practice of sending specimens to Dublin via the then extensive regional ferry rail networks. What is also of note is that while the initial impetus in terms of observing the whales uh, in the area came from the British Museum, it was to the National Museum in Dublin that, that de Lapp deposited finally the physical specimens. In her biographical essay on Delap, Anne Byrne cites Delap's commitment to keeping the whale specimen for Dublin, as she quotes Maud as saying that she would not, quote, would not let the Sosnock have such a treasure, i.e. not go to the British Museum. Unfortunately, there is no exact reference for that quotation, but yet it's extremely interesting considering the arguments put forward recently by Julia, Juliana um, Adelman and Dermot Finnegan in terms of the role that the study of natural history uh, made as a discipline and as a practice and the role that it made in the development of Irish and Scottish civic identities in this period. In conclusion, in offering a deeper exploration as to the gendered sets of fieldwork practices associated with late Victorian scientific culture, this paper makes a wider argument as to the situated nature of knowledge formation, production, and circulation. It is also important to recognize that as a cultural phenomenon with values attached, there is nothing natural about the study, writing, and practice of natural history. Indeed, as a term, the term as a subgenre of the history of science privileges European universal time rather than space or place per se. And so location, geography, or what Pat Sheeran uh, discussed as the idea of the genius of place often gets lost in translation. When one considers the multiscalar and various roles played by individuals, field clubs, learned societies, institutions, national cultures and intellectual traditions, and how all of those factors are intellectually uh, and culturally connected, it becomes increasingly obvious to place an emphasis on the contingent nature, if not the intense localness, of the development of the cult and culture of natural history in 19th century Britain and Ireland. As Sean Lysett argues, the study of the history of science, quote, involves a consideration of the history of science as a component of local historiography and also the status of science as a cultural practice in the context of, of an Irish cultural debate, end quote. Other scholars such as Jupp Learson, John Wilson Foster and Dorinda Outram are also anxious to foreground uh, this aspect of the history of science in Ireland as well. De Lapp never left her home in Valencia and was kept very busy with her work volunteering with her sisters at the local hospital and fishermen's tea rooms, in addition to documenting and occasionally publishing her findings and observations concerning the maritime life of the region. She remained unmarried and references both from family interviews and published sources indicate that she had fallen in love with Brown during his time in Ireland in the 1890s, but that the affection was not reciprocated. Notwithstanding this, de Lapp sent him violets on his birthday every year until his death in 1937, um, some of which are actually archived in the National Museum in Dublin. She died on the 23rd of July 1953 and was buried with her sisters in the Church of Ireland graveyard near Knightstown on the island. Joanna Lee noted that Mrs. Dore, the de Lapp's housekeeper, who is the, the lady um, carrying that enormous amount of hay, uh, looked after each of those three sisters as, she became, as they became ill. Uh, Mrs. Dore would sit outside their door at night in case she would be needed and publicly keened the loss of each sister's passing. Peter de Lapp recollects, quote, at the end she would sit for hours outside Aunt Mary's bedroom door and wrapped in her shawl, drawing on a little clay pipe and ever alert for a sound from within, quote. <laughs> The legacy of de Lapp then can be regarded in terms of rethinking the borders of the study of natural history in foregrounding the contribution that marginal and island spaces made to Victorian field cultures in this period.
Secondly, it opens up questions as to the interconnections between local places that become sites of inquiry and transnational scientific cultures in terms of rethinking the spatiality of science and the various spaces, whether they are domestic, regional, national or imperial. This is also of particular importance when thinking of the contributions that amateur and professional naturalists and scholars equally made, uh, both in the past and in the present day, often working alongside each other in the field, one relying on the other for different forms of knowledge. In their creation of a nascent sense at the time of an Irish natural history that was visually symbolised by and are articulated within the newly formed Dublin Natural History Museum, uh, what children affectionately call today as the Dead Zoo. Finally, in opening up an alternative narrative of the sociology of fieldwork and domestic science, it foregrounds the necessity to take into account the gender geographies of the making of natural history and of various scientific practices in the period. The complex web of connections that linked Valencia to the scientific worlds of Dublin, London and New York also served as an intellectual social network that stretched across Maud Lapp's life and career as an amateur natural scientist. While Delap's maritime life and work is deeply rooted in the island space of Valencia in the period, it has also made a contribution beyond those shores and therefore compels us to rethink the spaces of science and fieldwork cultures in a broader European and Atlantic context. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Nessa. <coughs> um, for that um, very poignant moment when you mentioned that she sent violets every year on his birthday to her unrequited lover. One would wonder what he would have made had she, had he, had she sent him a bunch of asparagus. Um, it carries a completely different uh, meaning and connotation to us all now.